I see a lot of firm owners that just get reluctant about making any sort of investment or hiring anybody. And they're like, well, if I'm gonna hire this person, I'm gonna pay X amount of money, I'm gonna pay more money. And my thought is always, well, if you don't hire this person, you're gonna pay for it every day until you do. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. This is Jessica, head of coaching strategy at Crisp, and today we're flipping the script for another special edition episode to get Michael's take on how to find the courage to take the entrepreneurial leap, how to overcome the challenges and uncertainties of making a crucial hire, and how to effectively market your law firm and establish a strong client base from the ground up. You have to be able to answer, I think, one fundamental question, and it's why would somebody hire you and not your competition? And if you can't answer this question, that's probably why they're not hiring you. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Here we are, another day, another black t-shirt. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm ready for the AMMA. And you know, normally we start off the podcast, Jessica, we tell them they can submit their questions to 404-531-7691 and that we got three different types of episodes in this podcast. We got the traditional interview format, the encore editions, and the Ask Michael Mogul Anything you know, we tell them all about that, that they, we don't run any ads on the podcast. And there's no fee for the podcast. But if you enjoy the episode, share it with a friend. And most importantly, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. I know we know we're telling those things. But let's just get right into it. All right. Thank you for telling them what we normally tell them. With that. Hi, Michael. I've been at the same firm for eight years and desperately want to open my own firm. My wife and I are very tight on money. We have two boys, four and two, that we need to provide for. So not having a financial cushion is the only thing stopping me from making a move. I hear a lot about money not being a factor if you really want something, but that's probably only true for someone who doesn't have a family to feed. What can I do to open up shop if lack of finances is holding me back? So look, there's a couple of ways we can look at this situation. And when someone says like money is not a factor, I mean, it is to some degree. Bills still have to get paid. You still have to be able to you know, provide for your family. So yeah, money does play a role. But the challenge here is like you want to go off on your own, but you have, you're in a kind of a place where... You've got people who rely on you. You've got a family. You've already got your overheads. So here's the biggest difference for you, right? It's much easier if you're just somebody who's just on their own. You can live off ramen noodles. You really don't have many expenses. And you could just, hey, give it a shot. What do you got to lose, right? It's like you don't have anybody who's really dependent on you for anything. And at the same time, you're not driving around the Mercedes. You don't have a Porsche. Life hasn't gotten that good yet. So you really don't have anything to lose. It's interesting. It's like when I started the business, when I say I started with $500 to my name, believe it or not, that makes it easier because it's like, what do I have to lose? Right. It's not like I didn't have a home. I didn't have a family. I didn't, you know, so an ironic way, kind of a privileged position to start a business in. But once you have all those things, it's hard to give them up. And I think that's the biggest challenge here. So the short answer is, is that, look, you're going to have to be able to set aside some money. Okay. You guys are going to have to be able to live as lean as possible so that you can start building the amount of resources and investment that you're going to need to start your own firm, right? You're going to have to figure out what that amount is, right? You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to go buy an office. You don't have to buy a bunch of chairs and hire a bunch of people. It's like, you got to be a MVP, minimal viable product, right? What do you need? You need internet access, right? Which you probably already have at home. You're going to need to be able to, I imagine you need some sort of online presence or website. You get people have to have a way to contact you, but you may, you may not even need any of those things. You can start working with people one-on-one -on -one and they can start sending you cases. You don't even need business cards, right? So you can do this for a lot less like you don't need t-shirts and hats and swag and all sorts of shit like that. Just get going, get customers, right? Get a client, right? Get a case. But if you're not prepared to, like, I think the real question is, is like, I have a hard time leaving my salary, right? Because this provides me with a safety net. So then you figure out, okay, what is my actual cost of living? And how do we, how can we as a family live as lean as possible? Maybe this means we're not going to be taking as many vacations this year. Maybe it means we're not going to take any vacations this year. Maybe it means we're going to cut down on some of our subscriptions. We're not going to order out to eat. Like you just have to decide like, 
do you want to actually do this? Because if you're saying, well, that all sounds a little bit unreasonable. I don't want to reduce our quality of life. It's like, you know, our kids are used to doing X, Y, and Z. And we got one kid who plays like polo or something like that, right? Or you know, ice hockey or, you know, s- some sort of sport. So it's like an expensive sport. It's like, well, maybe we have to put them in soccer. Okay. Like maybe we got to put them in, uh, you know, something that's just, this does not involve like any sort of expense. Put them in a rec league, right? Oh, okay. Well, so you have to really rethink what you'd be willing to do because of how, you know, how important is it for you to be able to start out on your own? If you're then thinking about it, well, that's one thing. If it's something where it's like, I'm committed to this, I want to bet on my own decision making. You know, I believe that, you know, I have this vision for my future. I want to be able to be my own boss, which is kind of one of the dumbest things you could ever say. Right. So whatever it is that you're doing now, I promise you, it's going to be harder doing it on your own. 100%. Okay. Somebody else right now is carrying the weight of a lot of the stress that you would be experiencing once you go off on your own. They're figuring out right now how to bring the cases in. They're figuring out right now how to meet the payroll. They're figuring out right now how to be able to cover all the different overheads and provide for everybody. And when you leave, if you're saying that you could do it better, which you know may be true, who knows? I don't know. Now all those things become your problem. Everything becomes your problem. And if you think, oh, I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to work my own hours. I'm going to kind of work from wherever the hell I want. Like, yeah, I mean, sure, you can work wherever the hell you want, but your hours, if you're going to be supporting yourself, probably not going to be any less no. than whatever it is you're doing is at any full-time role. In fact, they're probably going to be more, maybe double, at least for, for a certain period of time until you start to really figure things out. So the slow way to do it is that, you know, you start putting money aside and it's going to take longer because you want to maintain supporting your family. So you have to lower expenses somewhere to create some sort of cushion. And then you set aside, I don't know, a thousand bucks a month, maybe more if you can do it. And then you figure out how much money do I need to be able to go off on my own. And you want to be able to have enough in terms of like living expenses. This might take a long time. This may take a few years, but that's, that's what it takes. Maybe you're like, okay, I don't want it to take a few years. Well, then you got to reduce your standard of living like significantly because you got to reduce the cost so you can make, be able to put away more into savings. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, you can't get around that. No. You know, maybe you can get someone to invest in you. Maybe you can get somebody to loan you some money. I don't know how many people are just loaning people money these days. Uh, and if anybody loans loans you money, I look at that as like, you know, gifting money because you're never going to get that money back. That being said, look, that's just the reality of it. But if this is a must and this is something you really want to do. You find a way. You just find a way to do it. You just find a way to do it. You're not the first person with a family and with kids who's decided to start their own business. Maybe you're staying at the firm that you're at right now, but as soon as you get home and it's five, six o'clock, that's when your, you know, your firm starts and your firm goes from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., right? Then you get a little bit of sleep and you wake up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and then you go up to your, your full-time role and you repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat until you just eventually, all you do is, you know, your business. And you're like, oh, that sounds like a lot. Well, that's it. I don't, I don't know what the expectation is. I, I sometimes feel like these questions I almost want an answer of like, there's a of, silver of, bullet of sympathy. Yeah. Right. Of saying, you know what? You're right. Your unique situation means that perhaps like you're doing everything you can. It's just hard. Yeah, I get it. Uh-huh. If that's what you want to hear, then this is definitely not for you. Definitely. Please do not go and start your own business. I mean, for your sake, like it's going to be a lot harder than you think, but you can either give yourself an excuse or you can go and find a way. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be making everybody comfortable and it doesn't mean it's going to be easy and it's going to have a lot of uncertainty and it's going to have a lot of instability. And if you want to avoid a lot of that, then start set, put, putting money away. But the problem with doing it that way is then I find in many cases that day never comes. And you start putting money away, but it's like you just secrete your comforts. You know, you start to scale up your lifestyle and then it's just too hard to abandon what you've already got, right? It's too hard to, you know, to scale down from the life you're living day to day and the trips that you're taking and the cars you're driving and the food that you're eating and like try to scale that down to make a decision like starting your own business and invest in that and then years from then, then scale it back up. It's just, it's hard, you know? I just remember years ago, friend, colleague, acquaintance of ours uh, wanted to go start his own business. You remember this? And this is when you were like, you know, it really is a privilege that you started with just $500 because there was nothing really for comparison there. But He had the cush life. He had, I think, a Mercedes company car. He had the expense. He had all of the things. And so you're like, yeah, man, I'll help you. I'll mentor you. Let me know the day you quit your job and you go all in. I'm there for you. About eight years later, we still have yet to hear from him. Yeah. (laughs) So and that's and that's the thing. All these different creature comforts that we have in life are what also bind us to to that life. It's hard to escape that. Because then you got something to lose. Yeah. And you got a lot of things to lose. And it's hard to abandon that, truthfully. And I'm not knocking it. It's just that the reality of it is you got to really not just want it, but you got to be truly committed to it. And things sometimes get worse before they get better. Sometimes you have to like scale down your home. 
Sometimes you have to scale down your standard of living. And that's really hard for people to do because then they get a lot of societal pressure and they're trying to keep up with somebody else and they're trying to look a certain way. And again, that's just going to prolong all this and you may not ever do it. So sometimes you just got to rip the Band-Aid off. That's it. All right, moving on. So after reaching my capacity as a solo practitioner, I'm ready to expand my practice by hiring my first associate attorney. However, the prospect of managing a six-figure hire significantly higher than my current staff feels overwhelming. How can I overcome the challenges and uncertainties of making this crucial hire? Yeah, so your capacity, max of what you can do. So naturally you make the decision, which is probably a good one, to hire another attorney. You can share the workload with them and can free you up in some way. And that can free you up to be able to do something else. Maybe it allows you to be able to build more relationships and partnerships. Maybe you're the rainmaker. It allows you to bring in more cases. It allows the firm to grow, basically. Because so long as you're at capacity, you're a bottleneck on the law firm. Like, firm cannot grow anymore. Like, you're working the maximum number of hours or you're doing the most that you could possibly do. And you are literally the bottleneck of the business. And if the goal is to be able to grow, whether it's grow revenue, grow profit, you're going to need help. So you decide, okay, I need to hire somebody. But if you're looking for good help, Good help oftentimes has, you know, it's not inexpensive. But rather than looking at anyone that you hire as a cost, I mean, again, like a cost is something that you spend that you do not get a return on. Like it, people are an investment. Like I've never in my life ever hired somebody with the expectation that I'm going to make less money. The purpose of hiring somebody is to, you know, it's an investment. Those people allow you to expand the capacity of the firm. That allows you to expand the capabilities of the firm. Like you're able to get to where you're going because you are able to expand those two things, capacity and capability. So if you look at it through that lens. The other thing is, let's say, I mean, again, I don't know what the compensation is for easy math. Let's just say 120000 right? Roughly $10,000 a month. Now, when you're hiring anybody for any role, five-figure role, six-figure role, beyond, you're not paying them, you know, 12 months up front or 26 pay periods up front. Like, it, it's not like they sign and they say, okay, the salary is $120,000 and write them a $120,000 check. It's like, no, you're going to pay this person every two weeks right? In many cases. So if it's say, if we're talking about the person who's $120,000, 10,000 a month, let's say roughly 5,000 every two weeks. Okay. So then you have to look at it from the standpoint of how long is it going to take me for me to train and develop this person, right? If, if that's what they require and how long before I, you know, can actually like delegate things to them and then they start to bring about a return. And you want that to be in, in my experience, 90 days, right? 90 days or less. So really your risk in quotes of investing in this person is three months salary. So in this case, $30,000. So it's not like a six figure risk it's 30,000, but then it's also again, from the standpoint of like, if you do not make this investment, how does the, your capacity ever expand and how does the firm ever grow? So like in some cases it's like, okay, we're at the point where we have to do this or you simply will not be able to do more. And I see a lot of firm owners who just get reluctant about making any sort of investment or hiring anybody. And they're like, well, if I'm going to hire this person, I'm going to pay X amount of money. I'm going to pay more money. And my thought is always, well, if you don't hire this person, you're going to pay for it every day until you do. So there's already a cost associated with not, not only the opportunity cost of what the firm could be in growing, but there's also the cost of like, you know, what about your well-being? Like the time and energy that it requires for you to be doing everything. Does that free you up to be, you know, a leader in the firm? Does that free you up to make decisions that allow you to work on the business, not in the business and actually grow the firm? So you've just got to be able to wrap your head around that. And in terms of like managing them, again, the best people come in with batteries included. So they come in and they're able to add value and like almost immediately. So when you're thinking about like managing someone is like micromanaging to make sure they're doing their job. And if that's, I mean, you should be hiring the type of person that is accountable. And then that's something you can vet in the hiring process and making sure that, you know, again, what are you hiring here? What am I buying? Hire right? better than yourself. Yeah. If you're, if you're hiring someone better than yourself, they're going to come in and like, they're going to make life easier. They're going to be great. And yes, of course, they're going to require support. You're going to have to make sure they're all set up. They get an email and they may need like a laptop or computer. You know, they're going to have like those resources, but that's, you know, that's not a big deal. The same way I look at our team, like we could not get to where we're going without our team. Like I cannot do anything alone at all. And if you try to grit your way through things, you're going to hit a cap and you're going to be the bottleneck. Right. So if you want to be able to grow the business, you have to be willing to make investments that will allow you to grow the business. And that, that allows you to expand your capacity through hiring additional people or capabilities like new things that, you know, that they come in with skills that you don't have, or they can be complementary skill sets. Like that is what allows the business to grow. And if it doesn't work out, okay, that happens too. And then you hire somebody else. And if that person doesn't work out, that happens too. And then you hire somebody else. And then eventually you get there because if you fail to make decisions like these, then you just stay small. And you stay small and you stay frustrated and you stay overwhelmed and things never, ever, ever, ever get better. But you did save all that money. Yep. Nothing changes. Even though Nothing changes. every day you're barely hanging on. Yep. I don't know what you're saving. Yeah. All right. 
and to round us out today. So I've decided to start my own law firm, but I'm struggling to attract clients and build a steady stream of business. How can I market my services effectively and establish a strong client base from the ground up? What a great question. Here it's we like go. Billion dollar question. Yes. Start your firm and it's like, how do I attract clients and cases? Well, I wouldn't say that this is a, you know, a question that is uncommon amongst pretty much every lawyer and law firm owner in America, but I'll give you kind of the, you know, the baseline things because look, we've written a, an entire book on it. It's called The Game Changing Attorney. It's available on Amazon. You can just go to gamechangingattorney.com. You can get the first chapter for free. Okay, and it's literally on this exact topic of how does a solo, a small firm, or even a mid-sized firm, how do you differentiate and stand out from the competition? How do you attract more discerning clients and better cases? I literally wrote the like, DIY book that you can do this all yourself. It's all in the book. But you have to be able to answer, I think, one, one fundamental question. And it's why would somebody hire you and not your competition? And if you can't answer this question, well, then that's probably why they're not, hire, you know, they're not hiring you. Because somebody else may have more resources. They may be more top of mind. Like you may look at it from the standpoint of like, what is it that we do different? Maybe you, you know, you grew up in the same community that you practice law in. Maybe you're very active in the community. Maybe you have, you know, a, an amazing trial background. Maybe you have, you specialize in a certain, you know, specific type of case type. Maybe you believe you care more and you can prove it. Maybe there's something that makes you unique and you have to be able to be clear on why would somebody hire you specifically over another competing law firm? Because people have a lot of options. And let's say, I mean, I don't know the practice area here, but maybe you're, you're contingency based, right? People have a lot of options. So it's not going to be a, a function of like what the fees are. So I think mean, I think that's number one. And then beyond that, it's like you get that message out there. You got to be clear on what the value proposition is. Then you create content around that. You have to get known somehow. Like if, if people don't know you, you exist, no matter how great you are, I don't care if you're board certified, like no matter how great you are, if, if someone does not know that you exist, that person cannot hire you. So initially, you're probably going to start off with like word of mouth and referrals and networking and, you know, attending various like local community functions, building relationships with other lawyers and just doing great work. So that those clients that you work with, you know, refer you to other clients. You got to kind of grow organically. Then you're also going to be creating content around just online around like just what it is that you do and how you differentiate. Maybe you're creating like educational content. Maybe you're creating FAQ style videos. Maybe you're doing things that showcase like just your story and your why about why you became an attorney, right? Because there's going to come a point where if somebody finds you online, they're going to look you up and say, okay, well, why this person, right? They do a Google search and they search for like your practice area in your city and boom, you know, there's like 10 listings on the first page and like someone's got 5,000 reviews, maybe you got three reviews and it's like, how do you compete with that? So I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do, but none of them are going to be overnight. Alternatively, you could just run paid ads or you could run like, you know, Google pay-per-click ads, but so is everybody else. And, and if you don't have the financial means to really compete in that area, because usually the type of leads and cases you're going to bring in there are going to be very, you know, low value and low margin. I mean, it's it maybe great for getting your start, but at the same time, it's maybe that type of case that they're going to really allow you to scale. And then all the law firms are already spending a ton of money there. So the cost is going to continue to increase. So the cost per lead and the cost of acquisition. So there's a lot involved here. The biggest thing I could say, and this again, this might come across self-serving, but you know, you don't have to do it with us. It's just don't do this alone. If you're going to try to figure this out all on your own, it's going to be slow and it's going to be painful. But be my guest. The best way to be able to like solve the problem that you have right now is to find the right community of other like-minded law firm owners that have like the results that you want and then to learn from them. This is where our coaching program exists, right? Like Chris Coach, go to chriscoach.com. You can learn about it, right? It is to help you with this exact challenge of like, how do I really scale? How do I get this going? And it's, it's not just scaling up to a million, then it's scaling to 5 million, then it's scaling to 20 million, then it's scaling to 50 million and beyond. Okay, and it's like different things and different communities at each of those levels and like different principles and the firm looks different and different strategies, but you've got to do something. So at the grassroots level, it's like, you just got to build relationships and hope that, you know, somebody thinks of you and sends you a case. But you really got to figure out like what your message is, what your differentiators are, why someone would hire you and not another firm. That's just for the marketing portion, right? And then you got to get that message out there somehow yeah. and compete. But then there's everything beneath the iceberg of like, well, how do I make sure that when somebody does call our firm that we are actually responsive to that person, that we sign that case, right? How do we make sure our intake's dialed in? Then how do I make sure that like once we're starting to get cases that these cases are actually being moved forward properly, right? And then what happens when your capacity is maxed out? And then how do you hire additional people? And like, how, what's the proper way to be able to attract the best people for your for firm? And then how are we going to operate in terms of like our alignment and our core values? And how are we going to manage our finances? And what are our systems going to be? And like operation, how are we going to get this done? How are we going to manage client experience? Like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, this is this is, this is not a two-minute answer. 
right? There's, it's a wealth of knowledge. And if you want to go and go and try to figure that out on your own or try to take some online course or have someone teach you how to build a funnel, then this is not for you, right? At least just don't do it with us. I'd say the best way to be able to learn is to learn from those who already have the results. And then to be in that type of network, to be in that type of community where you can bounce ideas off one another, people are open and sharing and just transparent and they bring humility. You're going to get there so much faster when you don't have to make every mistake on your own. But if you don't want to do any of that, go buy the book, GameChangingAttorney.com, and I at least talk about how to do the differentiation piece and how to stand out and how to get your message out there and how to get the cases. But the cases, I mean, that's the surface level, right? It's yeah. like, okay, you get that. Now and you start to scale that up. But then the real challenge is building a real business. Because if you're thinking about just how do I get a case? Well, as soon as you start to get that part right, let's say you, you know, figure out the marketing portion, but the business isn't right, that, that's what's going to bring you under. The whole thing is going to fall apart. You're going to be stressed out and exhausted and working 100 hours a week. And they're going to say, what, you need more leads? You need to find a way to be able to like turn this into a business where it's sustainable. And it's one thing to like, you know, serve one client or two clients a month or five clients a month to have good outcomes. But what happens when that scales up and you're doing it 100 or 1,000 times a month? How do you deliver that consistent level of client experience and service? And look, it's your reputation. You got a few bad apples in there. You have a few bad outcomes. And before you know it, the word spreads and you can bring the whole thing under. So don't try to do it on your own if you want to avoid pain and suffering. That's all it takes. No big deal. It's easy. Yeah. Just launch a few ads. All right. Do some SEO. All right. You got a point there. All right. Next time. <laughs> next time. See ya. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with Michael Mogul. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that we can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of Michael's book absolutely free at gamechangingattorney.com. Number two, you can shoot Michael a text at 404-531-7691 and ask him any question you'd like. You might just hear the answer on the next episode. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it will help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on this episode, see the show notes in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com.